his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And his name is the hope of all the world. It's Christmas time and we have so many hopes and dreams and plans and excitement. And I know there are kids who just can't wait to jump into those presents, to unwrap them and tear them open. And here's the thing is all year long, we have a choice in what we focus on. And at Christmas, you have a, you have a choice to unwrap the Prince of Peace the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the very hope of this world, or to just go to another party, to experience another holiday, to have a little bah humbug and be tired and go, oh man, I'm glad all that's done. That, that's a choice, and we make it all year long, but especially at Christmas. Uh, as we come together, we've been in a series called Unwrapped. And there's been a key verse that we focused on, and I want to read that together here from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Read this out loud with me. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Wow. Joy and peace and hope, that's needed. I mean, that's the very essence of, of being able to breathe the, the breath of life. We need those. We're going to unpack these verses coming up in just a few moments, and I'm going to read in Philippians chapter 2, but first I'd like to just say a prayer, please. Dear Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your faithfulness. And God, joy, peace, hope. There's nothing greater than what you bring in the form of Jesus as you bring peace and joy and hope. God, I need it. I declare that. And it's in our weakness that I know you were made strong. So we come before you, an almighty God, and we proclaim you this Christmas, Lord of today and Lord of this upcoming year and, and our personal Lord. God, I ask that you would open your word to our hearts today in Jesus' name, amen. Today, we're going to look at that word hope, first of all. Say hope with me, hope. Man, isn't that a, just a wonderful word, ain't Hey, if you think of hope versus hopeless, I mean, hopeless just, you, you can just, even just saying it brings kind of the, the air out. But when someone says hope, it's a beautiful word. And normally at this time of year, we focus on the person, obviously, of Jesus Christ and how hope came to the world through a little baby, a little soft skinned baby. And we unpack Matthew and Luke, the accounts of the, uh, of the birth of Jesus. We talk about Mary and Joseph. We talk about the innkeeper. And we talk about the villain in the story, Herod. We talk about the shepherds. We talk about the angel on the hillside and, and the wise men making their, their journey to come and find the king of kings. We talk about all that happened here on earth. And today I want to look at Christmas and what Jesus did from the perspective of heaven, a little more than the perspective of earth. So that's why we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bible or your, your phone you'd like to pull it up on or just grab the bulletin or follow along on the screen, you're welcome to do so. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took on a humble position of a slave, or as other translation says, servant, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
I want to just jump into this. And first of all, in verse 6, it was, though he was God, he did not think equality with God something to cling to. You know, you cling to stuff, and I do as well. Sometimes it's truth. Sometimes it's a lie. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's something that brings life. And then other times we cling to things that are actually taking life. Right here, Jesus did not say, consider equality with God something to cling to. Do you get what he's saying? He's saying he let go of heaven to come down and grab hold of you, to grab hold of me. That's the bottom line. Jesus was willing to let go of his grasp on heaven to try and grab hold of you. You know, I, you know when you think about it, Earth compared to heaven, you know, the corner of Pearl and Gold Street versus down here is not an ultimate destination for God. I, I can't imagine him sitting around with the angels going, guys, I got a great idea. You know, I'm going to let go of heaven and I'm going to be born to a, a poor teenage girl and her fiance down, down in Bethlehem. And it's going to be in a, in a stable. And we're going to have a donkey around, some other stuff too, or it's going to be, hey there, isn't this just a grand idea? In fact, I'm going to grow up as a little kid. You know, I'm going to have to mind my parents. I'm going to have to go through all the learning process. I'm going to wear a diaper. You know, and then I'm going to grow up. I'm going to hang out with some, some smelly fishermen. Yeah. Hey, these are going to be my buddies. And, and then I'm going to spend 40 days without food. And I'm going to be tempted by the evil one. I'm going to allow him into my presence. And, and, and I'm going to be tempted, but I'm not going to eat for 40 days. And, and then I'm going to be ridiculed. I'm going to be mocked. And I'm going to be beaten. And then I'm going to be hung on a cross. Guys, do you like my plan? And they'd be going, no. What are you doing? You are God. And, and yet that's exactly what he did. Why would he come to earth? And do all this. He did it for you. He did it for me. Now be real careful because in your head you're doing the same thing that I do if not careful. I go, yeah, he came for all humankind and he loves the world and all the different children around in other places. And I push that love away from me. Do not do that this morning. See, he came for you, not just the world, not just the country, not just the state, not even just Manhattan, not even just this church, not even just the row. He probably likes the others in your row, but he likes you. I, I want you to make sure you understand that he loves you. See, this is a mind-blowing principle for some of us who are stubborn, who are religious, who think we have to be good to live up to it. That is describing myself at times as well. So put your seatbelt on because this is the truth. God is deeply, madly, passionately, unconditionally in love with you. And I know that's not easy to believe, but it is true. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how much you've gone to church or haven't gone to church. It doesn't matter whether you're on the naughty list or the nice list. He loves you. And he has a plan to redeem you. And it's your choice on what you're going to unwrap this Christmas. Are you just going to hold on to the same old beliefs in the same old way? Or are you going to say, I want to unwrap what you've given me? You know, Max Lucado, incredible author, speaker, pastor, writer, has an amazing way with words. He writes in his book, A Heart Like This, of God's love. And I want to ask you just to read this out loud with me. God's love never ceases, never. Though we spurn him, ignore him, reject him, despise him, disobey him, he will not change. Our evil cannot diminish his love our goodness cannot increase it. Our faith does not earn it any more than our stupidity jeopardizes it. God doesn't love us less if we fail or more if we succeed. God's love never ceases. Hmm. I hope that when you leave here today, you'll have allowed that love to seep in and you'll believe it for the first time maybe. Or if it's been a, a season where you've doubted it some, that you would let it come back to real in you. 
See, I know that some of you are arguing. I argue with me sometimes. And you know what? Whenever we argue in our heads, we win that every time. If I argue with the preacher, I win it every time. I, 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 it's just, it happens. We sit there going, no, I, you don't understand. Here, here's what I've done, or here's what's going on, or here's my life, and my life is different, or my mess is different, or my sin is different. And you know what? You're just going to be right. I'm just going to tell you right now, you're going to convince yourself of that, and I do as well if I'm not careful. So I want to ask you just to shut the mind down for a second and not believe all those lies and just realize this. I don't know your mess. I don't know your life, and you don't know mine. But I do know this, that Jesus, there's nothing bigger than Jesus coming to this world and hope being born by God coming to earth. Now, I'm sure that you've heard someone say, you know what, I, I just think they're beyond hope. You may have said it about yourself. I, I, I'm just hopeless. I, no person is beyond hope. No person is beyond hope. You are not beyond hope. I am not beyond hope. See, Jesus let go of his grip on heaven so that he might grab hold of you. Verse 7 says, instead he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. That's, that's the Christmas story, guys. Do you realize it? I mean, right there. God coming to this world, being born as a human, as a slave, and to say, I'm going to serve this world. Wow, now how did he do that? Divinity in a human. Whew. You know, I have studied my life. I have read this word. I have thought about that. And if you expect me to answer, I have no idea how he did it. But I do know why he did it. He did it because of you. Let me share a story that might help you understand a little bit. It's about a medieval king years, hundreds of years ago. That He was a, a, just a really good king. I mean, his kingdom loved him. He didn't abuse them. He, I mean, he profited and blessed and cared for and protected his people. He had this magnificent castle that, that he could go up on top and look out over the kingdom and his people. And he would often go up there after supper and, and he would just look out over the people. And as they would come in from the fields and working and doing things and one night, he happened to notice just a couple hundred feet from the castle walls, there's this mud hut. And he had seen this lady coming in from uh, the fields working before, but just something about her just grabbed his attention this time. And, and it just there was a kind of a bounce to her step, and maybe she was singing a little bit, and she goes into her mud hut and her rags. And he's like, wow. And something about it grabbed his attention, and then Day after day, he started noticing. And over time, all of a sudden, he felt his heart being drawn. And, and then he realized, I'm falling for this woman. And he's like, I want her to be my queen. And he calls his advisor together because he knows this isn't normal. You're not supposed to bring a peasant into the, to, to the castle. But he says, guys, I, I just, I, and I have fallen in love with this peasant girl down right outside the walls. What do I do? And, and they're like, well, you're a king. You make the rules, just declare it, proclaim it. She is my queen, and she's going to be happy. She's going to be rejoicing. Just we'll bring her into the palace tonight. And he's like, I can. And he went, wait, 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 guys. We can't do that. I can proclaim that she's my queen, but I can't proclaim that she loves me. How do I? I would never know if she really loves me. I can't force her to. I want her to love me to, to become my queen. And so he, he says, that's just not going to work, guys. We need to think some more. And he goes up a few more days and watches. And then another advisor comes up and says, hey, we got, we got an idea. Girls love stuff. You can shower her with stuff. You are the king. You have the, the whole kingdom at your disposal. I mean, buy her house, get her servants, you know, make her so she doesn't have to cook anymore, fill her pantries with food, give her all new clothes to get rid of those rags. And, and you just, and she will be totally in love with all of that. And he's like, I can. You're right. I have ever. I can totally. But, but wait, 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 guys. 
how would I know whether she loves the blessings or she loves me? That, that's not going to work. And they're like, oh. So they're like, what is it? This king doesn't understand he's the king. And they're frustrated and they kind of walk off. And, and that night he goes, I, I, I know what I'm going to do. And he doesn't tell anybody else, but he waits for the sun to rise. And right as the sun is coming up, he goes down to the servant quarters and goes out the servant exit where the servants and the slaves would go in and out of the castle. He takes off his kingly robes. He takes off his crown. He lays down his scepter and takes off his signet ring and puts it all down. He grabs some basically rag servant clothes that were hanging by the wall and puts them on. And he walks into the field where he knows his beloved will be. I mean, that's just romantic to think that he would give up all that to be with her. And yet it ought to remind you of something. Luke chapter 2 says, and you will recognize the king by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Our king became just as ragged as the ones he loves. Jesus let go of heaven so that he might grab hold of you. Do not miss that this Christmas. If the story ended right there, it'd still be an amazing story. But Jesus didn't come down just to say, okay, I, I, I'm going to come and live happily ever after and, and die a peaceful death with my beloved See, it says in verse 8, as the Christmas story from heaven's perspective continues, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus died in a way that no one wants to die. He had an appointment with a cross. When you unwrap the birth of Jesus, you unwrap the crib and you must also look at the cross. You cannot separate the crib and the cross when it comes to Christmas time. See, it's who Jesus is. It's part of who he is and what he did. Jesus let go of heaven to become a human, a servant, to die on a cross for my sin, your sin. Verses 9 through 11 say, Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, declaring Jesus Christ is Lord is what we do at communion. We do it during what's called the Lord's Supper. And we remember the, the crib that brought hope exploding into the world in the form of a little baby Jesus. And we remember the cross in which ultimate love was expressed and grace was given. Not one of us is without sin and not one of us has so much sin that the cross doesn't pay the penalty. That's what communion is. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I come before you, an almighty God, and I say, Lord, we need you. God, I am so thankful for the cross. I am so thankful for what you've done in my life and grace and forgiveness. And Lord, I ask that as we are about to partake in communion again, this 2,000-year-old tradition, that it be alive to each of us. God, I ask for forgiveness for trying to be strong when I just need you. I ask for grace for all my sin. And Lord, together we cry out, you are our God, our, God, our Lord, our Savior, our King. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you take the elements of communion, please? Tear off the top, a little clear cellophane.